So this week, we are going to be continuing in our series, our covenant series, and today we are going to be going and talking through the Davidic covenant. So would you all stand with me as I read God's word? And today we're going to read out of Psalms 89, verses 30 through 37. If his sons forsake my law and do not follow my statutes, if they, if they violate my decrees and fail to keep my commands, I will punish their sin with the rod, their iniquity with flogging. But I will not take my love from him, nor will I ever betray my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant or alter what my lips have uttered. Once for all, I have sworn by my holiness, and I will not lie to David, that his line will continue forever, and his throne endure before me like the sun. It will be established forever like the moon, the faithful witness in the sky. You may be seated. That is God's word. Amen. 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 Well, good morning, Spring Lake Church. If you don't know me yet, my name is Bill, and I'm one of the pastors here on staff at Spring Lake Church. It is great to be with you. If we've never met before, uh, just come up and say hi to me after the service. I would love to meet you. Um, I have really been loving this covenant series lately as we trace uh, this redemption story of God through the Bible. It's been great to see how the covenants, they really all connect to each other, and they're really telling this story of God, humanity, and redemption. And I've, I've loved those themes. Now, I don't know if anyone else has made this connection. In the last service, no one made this connection except for me, so maybe it just says I'm a weirdo. But every time we begin talking about this curse in, in Genesis that um, an offspring of Eve is going to destroy, I can't help but think about the Chronicles of Narnia. Anyone else? Anyone else? Okay, I see a couple nods. Thank you for who nodded. But, you know, we are talking about this offspring of Eve who will eventually break the curse. And I keep thinking about how in that book series that humans are called sons of Adam and daughters of Eve. And in that series, there's a prophecy that states, when two sons of Adam and two daughters of Eve sit on the four thrones at Care Paravel, then Narnia will be free from the witch's curse, okay? If you don't know what I'm talking about, it sounds really weird already. But if, but if you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to like stop everything you're doing. You can actually just get up right now, leave, and read the Chronicles of Narnia series, okay? It's so good. You need to, you need to know this. Um, but it's almost as if you read this series, it's almost as if there's a weird parallel between the Bible and what C.S. Lewis wrote. It's just strange, right? But as I was preparing and saying this week, and I actually just couldn't help but think about how through the first half of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, there's this anticipation that's being built up. People are waiting. It seems like everyone's super excited about who? Aslan, the king. He's on the move, right? And there, everyone's um, just really longing for this king to come, and these characters, as they anticipate the coming king, it stirs up a longing in our hearts as well. If you've read the series or you've watched the movie, you know that we all have this longing deep within us, a longing to break free from evil and from sin, to have a righteous king and a righteous ruler who stands over us, who could do good, who can show us the way, who can uphold justice. We all have this deep inside of us. And what's interesting is that really relates really well back to the covenant that we're going to talk about today, the covenant with David. Because this covenant that we'll talk about today is all about an eternal king. But before we get into that, I have to show you a chart, okay? The chart's going to come up on the screen. This is a chart of all the covenants we've covered so far, and actually a covenant we'll We'll cover in the, couple, in the next couple of weeks. Sorry that it's so small. Uh, but I also want to show you this toy that I bought. Now, it was really hard to get this because these are Russian nesting dolls, okay? Which means that, you know, I don't know if you can get these anywhere now because of Russia and Ukraine and all that stuff. So I had to use this really special service to smuggle it into the country. It's called Amazon Prime. <laughs> One day shipping, all right? It was beautiful. All right, so check that out. Don't tell anyone that I told you, okay? But anyways, these Russian nesting dolls do a really good job of relating to the covenants that we see up there. Now, you're going to see that there's six covenants up there, and we only have 
five of these, but the idea is the Russian nesting dolls, they all fit within each other, right? So we can take all of these and put them one by one by one and put them back together and they all fit together. And that's kind of like this idea of the covenants. We have the covenant with creation, And that was God really saying, here, I'm going to create humanity. They're going to represent my rule and reign on the earth. And that really led to the Noahic covenant or the covenant with Noah, where God reestablishes that and says, I'm never going to destroy the earth again with a flood. And then that one really led to the Abrahamic covenant, where where God says, I'm going to create a people for myself through Abraham. and And through Abraham, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. See, what God is doing is he's telling you how this plan is going to unfold. And it brings us to the next one, which is the covenant with Israel, where God takes those people that he made from Abraham and he says, these are the laws that you should live by, and you're going to be a kingdom of priests, and you're going to show my light to the world. And that really led through there to this one we're going to talk about today. See how tiny David is? He's a tiny little guy. The idea that you're supposed to get here is that um, the narrowing of this idea of God's redemption plan, it's coming to fruition. It's getting closer and closer. We have this big creation mandate, and then, the, and then sin enters the world, and then slowly God is showing you how he's going to bring it back to this one point in time where he's going to redeem And so that's what God is doing. It's super fascinating to to have that broad picture because all of these covenants, they're all a little bit different, but when they come together, they represent God's plan of redemption. See, what God is doing is he's orchestrating his plan that it'll all culminate in one person. And spoiler alert, that person is Jesus. And we're going to talk about that in the next couple of weeks as well. But our covenant with David today is just a further unfolding of the plan. And the main thing that we're going to discover is the idea that God chooses to use an everlasting king and an everlasting kingdom as his next step in the covenants with people. So I'm excited to jump into that. But before we do that, let's pray together. Oh, Lord, king of the universe. That's you. God, you are sovereign over all things. You've spoken all things into existence. You are the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And I pray, Lord, that as we talk about kings and kingdoms in the Davidic covenant, we would realize who you are, that a little bit more of your character would be revealed to us, that we would see your faithfulness and your grace towards humanity, that you love us and you have a plan for redemption. And I pray, Lord, that you would help our response not just be understanding these things, but our response would be obedience to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today there are three points about the covenant with David that we're going to look at, and they're all about kings and kingdoms. So the first one is this, the role of God's chosen king. Now, we've seen this in other covenants. Before you actually get to the covenant, there's a bunch of lead up to it. And this is, this is the same thing with the covenant with David. There's an anticipation of what God is going to do. See, we can't forget that actually God, the God of this universe, stands outside of human history. He, he can see all of history unfold. He knows how it's going to happen Through all the covenants, God is orchestrating a plan. And last week, we left off with God entering into a covenant with Israel. And they were to be his nation of priests who would follow his rules, and they they would be a shining light to all the countries of the world that Yahweh exists, that he's a God, that he is good. But at this point, God, in, in Israel's history, God is the people of Israel's only ruler, The people of Israel, if you ask them at this time, they would say, like, God is our king. He's the ruler of the universe. And they had leaders like Moses, and later they're going to have the judges. But those leaders in the nation of Israel are supposed to look at God, and they're supposed to say, God is our king. He is our ruler. But if we're careful readers of Scripture, we know that a time will come when Israel will begin to have an earthly king. They'll want an earthly king. And if you go all the way back to Genesis 17, 6, and we talk about the Abrahamic covenant, this one, the middle one, uh, we know that actually through the Abrahamic covenant, God talks about there being a king. 
okay? And here's what he says in Genesis 17, 6, all the way back to Abraham. He says, um, Abraham, that the kings would come from this new nation that's being established. Here's what he says. I will make you very fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. Kings will come from you. Now, whenever you read back into scripture, what's really cool is um, you can always read something like that, and then you can go, okay, now that we know that God said kings will come from you, where do we see this happen, right? Because we know God is always faithful to his promises, so we know this has to come about at some point. So we go, okay, where are these kings? And then if you fast forward to uh, Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 20, God is taught talking to the Israelites via Moses, and listen to what he says. This is another prediction and kind of an outline of the kings of Israel. Uh, Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 20. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you and have taken possession of it and settle in it, you, and you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us, then when that happens, God says, be sure to appoint over you a king the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your fellow Israelites. Do not place a foreigner over you, one who is not an Israelite. And the king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. He must not take many wives, looking at you, Solomon, right? Or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of gold and silver. Again, looking at you, Solomon. Um, when he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write him for himself on a scroll, a copy of this law taken from that of the Levitical priest. It is to be with him and he's to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to reveal the Lord his God and to follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees and not consider himself better than his fellow Israelites and turn from the law to the right or to the left. Then he and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom in Israel. So you see God is instructing the Israelites even before they have a king. And God is anticipating a couple things in this passage, in this passage as he instructs them. First, he knows that even though Israel should always see him as king, like that's the way it was supposed to be. Israel's supposed to always see God as king. He knows that one day they're going to get jealous of the nations around them. In fact, they do, right? They look at the nations around them and they're like, we want a king. We want a central person of authority who can make laws, who can settle disputes, who can bring justice, who can bring mercy. And, and if we have this singular authority, then our nation will prosper. We'll get more money. We'll have all these great things. And so they look at the nations around them and they say, yeah, you know, it's good that Yahweh is there, but we really want an earthly king. And that's kind of what they say. And if, you, if you've ever studied Israel Israel's history, you'll know that that's exactly how all of this unfolds. In fact, in 1 Samuel chapter 8, uh, the elders of Israel, they come to Samuel and they request that they get a king, essentially. And, and God um, told Samuel to listen to the people, but he warned them about the consequences of having the king. God said that a king would take their sons and daughters, their fields and their vineyards, and their servants and livestock for his own use. He warned that the king would also oppress the people and take away their freedom. And despite God's warnings, the people persist in their quest. And so God, or actually Samuel, anointed Saul as the first king of Israel. So if you're wondering, how did Israel get a king? That's how Israel got a king. But back to the Deuteronomy 17 passage, even before God makes this covenant, with David about the kings, he begins to instruct this Israelite nation on the role of the king. See, God cares about who leads his nation. And so I just want to give you um, kind of this breakdown of what he's going to require. He requires that the king must be chosen from the Israelite people. So he must be a part of the nation. The king must not acquire many horses which would lead him back to Egypt, or take many wives, which could lead him away from the Lord. I mentioned Solomon. Solomon does exactly that. Uh, the king must not accumulate large amounts of wealth or property. He must read and study the law of the Lord. He's supposed to write it down. He must follow the commands of the Lord and not turn aside from them to the left or to the right. 
And you might go, well, why are you sharing all this with me? I mean, that's great that that's the king of Israel. But all of this is a really important backdrop for this covenant that God is going to make with David. The instructions given in Deuteronomy 17 laid the foundation for what a just and a righteous king would look like. It's the model for a just and righteous king. In fact, what we see later is that as the king goes, the king of Israel, so the nation goes. So if the king is following God and following the rules and loves God, then the nation will prosper. But as the king turns his heart away from God and he doesn't do what is required, well, the nation is led to ruin. If you've done any sort of study of the nation of Israel and the kings of Israel and later the kings of Judah, you know that that scenario plays out over and over again. And I couldn't help but notice how this also plays out today. Now, we could, of course, relate this to our nation, right? We could say, like, as our leaders go, so the nation of America goes, right? And that'd be easy to make a correlation. We could say good things and bad things probably about our leaders, maybe a lot of bad things, I don't know. Um, but we, we could easily relate it to that. But I think a very important parallel for us as we think about as the leader goes, so uh, the followers go, is this idea of the family, of our family. The spiritual health and the condition of the family is largely determined by the parents, and especially the husbands and the fathers of a family. Let me share just a crazy statistic with you. According to data collected by Promise Keepers and Baptist Press, if a father does not go to church, even if his wife does, one in 50 in his, of his children, oh, well, I'm sorry, people don't have 50 children, usually. <laughs> Only one child in 50 of a family like that would become a regular worshiper. If a father does go regularly, regardless of what the mother does, between two-thirds and three-quarters of the children will attend church as adults. And you're like, whoa, that's a crazy statistic. Fathers, in a very real, tangible way, you actually set the tone, the spiritual tone for your family. I'm not I'm not sharing that because I want, I want to say, like, you all better be here next week, fathers. Like, that's not what I'm doing here. But I do want to challenge you that whether you accept the responsibility or not, you as parents, what you do leads your family. What you do spiritually leads your family. It's either going to lead your family towards Jesus or away from Jesus. And you really don't have to be perfect to make an impact on your family. But what you do need to do is show up. You do need to pursue Jesus in the good times and in the bad times of life as an example to your family. Now, um, I kind of read this last service, and I saw some, like, maybe single moms or moms who husbands are not around, uh, they're like, oh, well, what does that mean for me? And listen, I don't know any spiritual giant that I've ever read about or heard of or know where their mom didn't also love Jesus, because that's part of God's plan for his family as well right? God, you can make a significant impact as a parent on your children. And because as leadership goes, so the family goes. So the father goes, so the family goes. As parents go, so the family goes. And so that's just a point to kind of take out of here. But let's take a look at this next point as we zoom in on the actual covenant. So now we have the backdrop to the covenant, and now we get to the actual covenant where God actually tells David what he's doing here. 2 Samuel 7, 8 through 16, here's what he says. Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off your enemies before you, and I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning and, and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up for you offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Of course, 
We know that David's son, Solomon, builds a temple. So God fulfills this part of it. But he says also that I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And I will be his father and he will be my son. And when he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, who I remove from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Now, we don't have time to read all of David's responses in this chapter of the Bible, but I do want to read for you the first couple sentences of how David responds when God tells him this. He says this, Who am I, sovereign Lord, and what is my family, that you have brought me this far? And if that weren't enough in your sight, sovereign Lord, you have spoken about the future of the house of your servant in this decree. Sovereign Lord is for a mere human. David gets it. David gets it. He's a mere human, and he's humbled by the promises of God. And what you're supposed to get from David's response is how big this promise is, how huge this promise is. It's vast. It's immeasurable. And God is continuing to show his character. You know, this is one of the things we've been learning through all these covenants. We see God's character over and over again. And we see in this God's character of grace and mercy towards people. David is just a guy. He's just a mere human. He was a shepherd boy. And yet God chooses immense blessing and promise. David gets to be the first in a dynasty that will last forever and, inc and include the king of kings, the king of this universe. David's going to be part of God's redemption plan for all of history. It's amazing. That is our God. That is the God who we still worship today, the God who wants to have a relationship with you, the God who loves, his, who loves you, the God who actually extends his grace to you through salvation in Jesus Christ every single day. He desires to have a relationship with human beings. That's our God. And so listen to all the promises and the conditions in this covenant. God's going to establish a dynasty for David. God's going to raise up a descendant for David that will succeed him as king. This descendant will build a house for God. Uh, God will establish the throne of his descendants forever. God will be a father to this descendant, and he will be a son to God. If the descendant disobeys, God will discipline him with the rod of men, but God's steadfast love will never depart from him. And David's dynasty and kingdom will endure forever. Now, you might, might have noticed in this passage that we actually never see the word covenant. In fact, people have been asking sometimes, like, I don't always see the connection between some of these covenants and the other one. Like, how did you get there? Or sometimes people will ask, like, I'm not sure how you understand this as a covenant. I didn't see the word covenant here because sometimes it's mentioned and sometimes it's not. Well, if you were listening really closely when Joel read the word of the Lord before we started the sermon, uh, we find from another passage in Scripture that this indeed is one of God's covenants. Psalm 80, 30 through 37, it says this, I, if his sons forsake my law and do not follow my statutes, if they violate my decrees and fail to keep my commandments, I will punish them with the rod, their iniquity with flogging. But I will not take my love away from him, nor will I ever betray my faithfulness. And then in verse 34, I will not violate my covenant or alter what my lips have uttered. Once and for all, I have sworn by my holiness, and I will not lie to David." It is clear that God makes this covenant with David, and it's based on who God is, on his character, on his faithfulness. I also like in this passage how God really clearly lays out the consequences for any king of Israel or later Judah that disobeys this covenant. No matter what happens, God says, I will not take my love away. And so in that sense, God, this is another unconditional covenant. God is saying, I will love you no matter what. But he also says in here, he's very clear that there are requirements and there's consequences for human beings. If a king from David's line forsakes the law and does not obey or listen to God, they will be punished. And you don't have to read very long or very far into the rest of the Old Testament to know that these kings are always messing up, aren't they? They're always messing up and God punishes them for messing up. 
And so this idea, really, that God says here is really foreshadowing the rest of the Old Testament. But something interesting plays out. We learn in in the New Testament from the Apostle Paul um, that the law, remember the law was given to Moses? We learn that the law in the New Testament was given in order to show people that they couldn't do anything good enough to actually be righteous before God, right? If you, if you think about why God gave the law to Moses, um, it's to be this holy nation, but also Paul reveals later, hey, you can't actually fulfill all these requirements. And so it actually shows the people of Israel that they need a savior, that only a perfect person could come and complete the law in its entirely. Well, the king's are a lot like this as well, because what you see is over and over again in the Old Testament, God talks about what the role of the king should be, and then you get all of these kings over and over again, even the good ones are not, are not entirely following God. None of them are perfect. They all make mistakes. They're all humans. And what you get over and over again through this systematic failure of these kings is you get this idea of when will we get this perfect king? When will he come? There's a need for the ultimate king. There's a need for the king of kings. There's a need for the righteous one who will come and lead the nation of Israel. And all of Israel is longing for this. And so that leads really well to our last point, which is the need for a king of righteousness. Now, you have to understand something. The promise in the covenant to David Um, actually becomes part of the nation of Israel's identity. They see themselves as sons of Abraham, as people who have God's law, and also as the one who is, they're the ones who are waiting for the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Just like Nardia is waiting for Aslan to show up, the Israelites begin asking this question, when will our king arrive? When will he come? From David on, every time there's a new king, the people are wondering, is this the promised king? Is this the king who will uh, bring in this nation that will be an eternal nation and he'll always sit on the throne? Is this the king who will deliver us from the oppression of our enemies? Is this the king who will rule justly? Is this the king who will conquer earth? Is this the forever king whose kingdom will have no end? And as Israel is conquered, and they're taken into exile, and they're disciplined for turning their back from God, they're still wondering, when's the king coming? When will the king come and arrive? God is always faithful to his promise, and so at some point this must happen. Even when the nation of Israel looks like it won't even exist anymore on the map, they're still asking, but what about the king? When will the king arrive? When will the king come? In fact, this is exactly what's happening in the first century. You want to shed some light on why um, people are so much anticipating the, the coming of the Messiah is because they're under Roman rule, and, and they're not free people, and they're saying, but where's the king? When, when, will, when will this messianic king return and free us from Roman rule? When will this happen? They're still waiting for that. They're longing for that. There's a need, and there's a longing for the king of righteousness to show up, the son of David. And while this idea of the righteous king, it began with the covenant of David, it actually gets expanded by the prophets. You see, the prophets know what was said to David, and they begin to talk about, through God's inspiration, who this king is going to be. And and, uh, Isaiah talks about this king, and we usually read this passage around Christmas time, because it fits really well with Christmas. But I want you to think about uh, this passage in Isaiah 9, 6 through 7 in relation to the promise that God makes to David in the covenant with David. Listen to what this says. It says, for to us, a child is born, to us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. And then listen. Listen. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. They're waiting for a king of David to come. The people are. 
It's cool how once you understand the covenant with David, it sheds light on these prophetic passages that all lead to Jesus. But we also see Jeremiah has a prophecy too. In Jeremiah 23, five through six, he says this, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will, be, will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. Ooh, sounds like Jesus to me. Now, I don't want to steal the thunder too much from the pastors who we're going to talk about the new covenant in the next couple of weeks, which is going to be really great. But we can talk about this covenant with David and not relate it to Jesus in the New Testament. Because you have to understand, all the New Testament writers are pointing to Jesus and saying, hey, remember way back when, when there was a covenant with David? Uh, that's, he's here. He, he's here. It's Jesus. It's Jesus who fulfills this covenant. And so here are, the, here are the connections. In the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are accounts of Jesus' life and ministry, they very clearly present Jesus as the long-awaited king of David. And they do this in multiple ways. First, right away in Matthew's gospel, it begins with a genealogy. And if you go back and you look at the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1, what you'll see is that it very distinctly ties Jesus, Jesus' lineage, all the way back to David. Okay, so you can trace it all the way back to King David. And then in the gospel of Luke, it, he records that Jesus is born in the city of what? Bethlehem. Do you know what another name for the city of Bethlehem is? The city of David, right? That was the city of David. And so that's establishing Jesus as this royal heritage coming from the throne of David. And then um, you get all these titles of Jesus in the New Testament. And uh, you find, for example, that uh, the crowds in Matthew chapter 12, they begin shouting, son of David, Son of David. They're calling Jesus the son of David. They're relating him back to the covenant with David. Uh, blind Bartimaeus does the same thing. He calls Jesus the son of David. And so it signifies that Jesus' messianic identity, that he is the promised king of the Davidic line. The gospel also refers to prophecies that speak of a Davidic king. Uh, Matthew cites Isaiah's prophecy of a virgin birth who will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Luke quotes the angel Gabriel's announcement to Mary, which includes the promise that her son will inherit the throne of David forever, Luke chapter 1. And finally, the, tri the triumphal entry. The gospel accounts of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, they depict him as a king riding a donkey and receiving acclamations from the crowd. And the events that are talked about there are actually events that are fulfilling a prophecy in Zechariah, which speaks of the coming king of David coming into Jerusalem, riding a donkey. And so what we see, in case you didn't catch it, is that Jesus is the fulfillment of the covenant with David. He is God's plan of redemption. All of the covenants are going to find their culmination in the coming of Jesus. And so we've been on this big journey together. Um, we've talked about these covenants all together. We've talked about creation and Noah and Abraham and Moses and David. And we're, we're going to be talking about the new covenant coming up soon. But I hope that you're getting this overall sense of what God is doing with these covenants. I hope it's helping you understand your Bible better. But more important than that, I hope you're realizing how amazingly gracious and faithful our God is. He is faithful to his promises. He brought us Jesus. He gave us his very own son as the culmination of all these covenants. You know, the covenant that God made with David in 2 Samuel 7 is a powerful reminder that God is a God of faithfulness and promise, even when people are not faithful to him. And you read the Old Testament and you're like, the nation of Israel, they have all these promises. The people of God, they're God's own people. They have all these promises that God one day is going to break this curse, that he's going to make them into this nation and they're going to have this king and, and yet they fail over and over and over again. And aren't you grateful that we serve a God who is faithful when we're not? 
I do. I am so grateful for that. This covenant teaches that God's faithfulness is not dependent on human merit or ability, but on his own character. As followers of Jesus, we can find comfort and assurance in knowing that God is always faithful to his word, that he's going to bring about his promises. And so when we look to the future and we say, well, what's in store for us after this life? We can actually look at God's promises in the past and say, God was faithful then, he will be faithful now. He will be faithful forever to us. That if we believe in Lord Jesus Christ, we have assurance that one day we will spend an eternity with him. And by the way, the proper response to a God who's always faithful, to a God who does what he says, to a God who lavishes us with his grace, to a God who gives us his own son, is to love him. That's the proper response. Like if you really believe that God has done all of these things and that he's given you salvation in Christ Jesus, then the proper response to him is to love him. And the Bible's really clear. What does it mean to love God? It means to be obedient obedient to his word. And we don't do that to earn favor. We don't do that to make God like us. He already loves us. He's already sent his son. He's already purchased us by his blood. We love him in obedience because that's, that's the proper response to a God who loves you that much. And so what does it look like in your life to have a life of obedience towards Jesus? If Jesus is the promised king from the line of David, the culmination of all the covenants, then our focus should be, how do I live in allegiance to the king? And maybe maybe you this morning can just take a moment and, and ask yourself this. Are there things that I need to do differently in order to really be obedient to Jesus? Are there things in my life that I know are just, man, this is just, it's rubbing me right now, I'm feeling convicted right now that I'm doing something or I'm engaged in something or I'm flirting with something that I know the Bible would tell me not to do. Maybe that's you. And maybe this is a moment in time where you can think about that and you can say, God, I wanna be allegiant to you. I wanna be obedient to King Jesus and give it back to him. Thank God that he's a God of mercy and grace, that he'll accept you, that he loves you, that he knows And he wants you just to walk with him, back with him. Let's pray. God, you are king. Jesus, you're the king of kings. You are the Lord of lords. You are the culmination of all these covenants. Lord, you secured for us eternal salvation through your work on the cross, through the life that you lived, through your resurrection. Thank you so much that we didn't have to earn it, that we didn't have to earn your favor somehow. But Lord, I pray that you would help us to be people who respond to those truths, who respond to the understanding that you're the king of kings with belief first, that we'd put our faith and our trust in you And Lord, I pray that as we do that, that also you would move our hearts to be obedient to you, to search out the ways in our lives where Jesus isn't on the throne, to think about the things that we're doing or the paths that we're pursuing where Jesus isn't first. And I pray, Lord, that we would go running back to you, that we would put our lives in line with your word, not to earn something, not to make you like us, but simply because we love you. Help our lives be a response towards how much you love us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.